to analyze the way that a system operates, we very often are interested in, it in three different responses. The impulse response, the step response, and the sinusoidal response. To get the impulse response from a system, we apply the Dirac function, the Dirac impulse, at the input, which is in the time domain, simply the pulse, and in the frequency domain, it converts to one. That means that the output of the system is equal to the transfer function. The step response is a unity step in the time domain. The signal is zero for all times t which are less than zero, and for all times t greater or equal than zero, the signal jumps to one. In the Laplace domain, that transfers to a one divided by the complex frequency s. And inserting that in the transfer function and solving for v out, we get the system response of the transfer function divided by the complex frequency. We already found at the Fourier series that sinusoids and cosinusoids are very handy waveforms to analyze circuits. And we can also use them together with the Laplace transformation. So here we apply a signal that is also again zero before the time zero and afterwards, as soon as we are at the time zero and greater than that, the signal is a sine wave with the frequency omega that transfers into the fraction omega divided by s squared plus omega squared in the Laplace domain. And we simply multiply that to the transfer function to get the output voltage of a system. Very often when we are calculating the transfer function of a circuit, we would end up with polynomials in the numerator and in the denominator, as we have seen from the examples with the LCR network and with the oscilloscope probe. Also previously, we have looked into the way to rewriting that into a zero and a pole configuration. So we have all the zeros here in the numerator up to the last one and all the poles go in the denominator also all the way up to the last one. Another mathematical tool which we can apply to rewrite that is called the partial fraction decomposition. And here I'm showing it for examples where the numerator has a lower order than the denominator. Using the partial fraction decomposition can be a very handy tool to rewrite the transfer function in a way that we can look up each part of it in a Laplace table and transfer it just back through the table. We keep the poles in each of their fractions as denominators here, and then we are finding the coefficients for each of those fractions here called K1, K2, and Km. Now each of those Ks on the ith position can be calculated down here. So you use the original transfer function from equation 120 and put s equals to exactly that pole. Furthermore, you multiply that transfer function at that pole with that exact pole which you want to derive the coefficient ki for. That means if we for example take 2 here, we would actually multiply with the s minus p2 and that means that it would actually cancel out and all the other zeros and poles would be calculated at that frequency s equals p2. Nowadays computers will help us to actually do those transformations of the transfer functions into the three different formats that we have seen so far. But it might be a really good idea to also know if it can be true what the computer is putting out at the end. You might have forgotten a minus somewhere, you might have made a typo somewhere, and then the computer is putting out some very unrelated stuff compared to the problem that you're trying to solve. Therefore, let's do one manual example here 
on applying the partial fraction decomposition for an example where the order of the numerator is less than the order of the denominator. We only have one s up here in the numerator, so the order up here is one, and we have three times the complex frequency in the denominator, which gets multiplied with each other, so there's an s powered by three down here. We have the three different poles, the first one at zero, the second one at minus one, and the third one at minus two. We insert those poles in the original transfer function and multiply with the corresponding pole. So s equals zero in the first place, s equals minus one for the pole s plus one in the second case, and s equals minus two for the pole s plus two in the third case. That gives us three different numbers that we can put in the new format of the partial fraction decomposition. For the first pole, it's three. For the second pole, it is minus four. And for the third pole, that parameter is one. And last but not least, we can look up those fractions in a Laplace table, where the first one transfers into a unity step function. The second one is an exponential function with the amplitude minus four and the argument being just simply t due to the one in the denominator. And the third one has a different frequency with the minus two in the argument of the exponential function, but the amplitude is one. And both of those exponential functions get multiplied with the step function. Furthermore, I would like to show you one example for an improper fraction, where n is greater or equals than m. In this case, the numerator order is the same as the denominator order. Both of them are two, as those are the highest exponents according to the frequency s. Now here we can do a little mathematical rewriting and express minus four as the numbers plus four minus eight over here. And therefore we can rewrite the fraction into two fractions. One is s squared plus four divided by s squared plus four. And the other one is the rest from above. That means the first one simplifies in the number one. And later on, we can simplify the second one into something where we can find the corresponding function in a Laplace table. So at the end of the day, the transfer function in the time domain here is the direct impulse from the number one and a sinusoidal response with an amplitude of four multiplied with the unity step for the second fraction. Now there are more mathematical tools and rewritings you can apply if the orders are getting bigger. And also, if you start dealing with conjugate complex poles and conjugate complex zeros, which you can do either by hand, but most of the days nowadays, you would solve these things with the computer and make sanity checks afterwards if it can be correct what the computer solved for you. So I would not want to go more in depth doing manual calculations on that. Instead, you can now apply the knowledge to specific circuits and calculate the output voltage if the input voltage is at the rock impulse and also the output voltage if the input voltage is a unity step. And to train your Laplace muscle a little bit more, you can do the same thing for a different circuit. And computers usually are not very helpful on putting up the transfer function, but they are very helpful in actually putting in the numbers and solve the equations for you. And finally, you can calculate the impulse and the step response of an active circuit. Again, make the trade-off, what can computers help you with and what can you do manually? It is a very good idea to manually calculate the transfer function 
but it might also be a very good idea to use a circuit simulator and verify that you did correct.